if you don't ask, you don't know. And my dad said, that's right. You got to ask. You got to stand up for yourself, not be that shy. I was 10 years old, mind you, you know, right? So right. I had to ask the questions. And so I learned from that. If you don't speak up, if you don't ask, also has a little bit to do with that. I'm, I'm the fourth of four girls. I had to speak up, right? Right. But, but if you don't ask, you don't know. Hey there, and welcome to the Tribe of Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Emmy Kirshner. I'm a serial entrepreneur, investor, and business coach for ambitious women who are boldly taking their business to the next level. And I believe that building a successful business isn't about working 24-7 just to merely meet a revenue goal. What it does take is a unique blend of dedication to purpose, courageous action, and frequently sheer will to overcome the odds that lead to meaningful impact and experiencing a life well lived. In each episode, you'll get to know the women and men who are unafraid to put it all on the line as they share the stories of success and failure that have made them incredible leaders and the magic they gift the world with. As you're listening, and I hope finding value, don't forget to share the Tribe of Leaders podcast with all of your other entrepreneurial friends and to follow us wherever you're listening to this podcast. Hey, Donna, I am so excited to have you on the show today, and I've been looking forward to our interview, partly because I haven't really interviewed anybody who works with futurists and innovators the way you do, and I'm really excited about learning about your PR agency and the podcast. So one, welcome, and two, share with everybody a little bit about who you are and the magic you make. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much. You know, I I will start out with yesterday, I woke up just amazed by the new photographs of the galaxies that were just shared with us from the NASA and the new Weber telescope. And those are the types of things that get me excited every day. Mm -hmm. So for the last 20 years with my agency, Laughlin Michaels Group, I've been working with emerging, you know, markets and companies led by visionaries and futurists. And these are the men and women that are creating these amazing tools and and automobiles and robots and platforms and things that we might have in our home, our car, or our pocket Mm -hmm. that allow us to do things that might have not been possible otherwise. And so a little bit of an inspector gadget experience that I have, if you recall the movie uh, with Matthew Broderick and he'd open up the coat and it would just be full of gizmos and gadgets. That's kind of the world I live in. And when I woke up yesterday and I saw these amazing images, Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, isn't that just spectacular? Made me think of my first, you know, camera, my first digital camera. And then it made me think of my first, you know, film based camera, 35 millimeter camera. And now we're having been able to take pictures Mm -hmm. from space or galaxies. So people like you and I, can stargaze and enjoy them and see that, wow, this is like something just to me is amazing. And, and so that's the world I, I, I live in and I love working with, you know, these creators and innovators. I, I, I consider myself a thinker, not a tinker. Mm-hmm. And so I get to work with a lot of tinkers <laughs> and it's just enchanting. It's just been a big part of my life prior to being a, uh, owning the PR agency. I was a journalist I wrote for Reuters International, which is now Thompson Reuters, Mm -hmm. which is an international syndicate. I lived in four countries working for them. I also worked for the BBC. And before that, I actually did internships with the Washington Post. So uh, I started my career out around age 10, which sounds phenomenally young, but it is. My parents, uh, my father particularly, and his brothers owned a family of newspapers. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to start out kind of my Nancy Drew years of reporting and curiosities and asking the right questions. And so by the time I was at college, heading off to college, I already had a portfolio of published work, which is kind of unusual for a 17-year-old. And kind of impressive. You know, at the time, I just thought it was normal. I figured that, hey, Amy does this, Donna does this, doesn't, you know, Jack and, and Morgan do it as well? I don't know. To me, it was just kind of normal that that one would do that. Then I realized when I got to college, it wasn't normal. I actually had, 
a professional paid, you know, journalism reporting job because uh, I had already done so much time and experience presenting myself, going in, interviewing for internships. I had a portfolio already, but I didn't realize it until I actually somebody else recognized, you know, that I had the talent and I had the the uh, portfolio to show it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious why work with tinkers? Like what makes them special for you? You know, my father was a tinkerer. So I think I, it's kind of <laughs> interesting that, you know, I was always running behind him as a kid and I, I would be visualized with my pigtails or, you know, ponytail and my coveralls. And if my father was in the garden, I was in the garden. And if he was in the garage working on making something or he was running off to Radio Shack to create right. get the tools, I was always there. And so I I was constantly entering, you know, in science fairs and different things that are kind of rock collecting and things. I call them kind of nerdy things. Some of them were related to Girl Scouts. Others were related to 4-H, which is an agricultural uh, group similar to, to Girl Scouts. And so it was always around me. And if I wanted to read something extra fun or have my father take me to the library yet for the third time during the week, I could convince him that I needed to get a book on science space or something to do with transportation. And he would take me. So, yeah. So he was a huge influence. And I also didn't realize what a huge influence he had on me till I was graduating from college and I was asked to do my class speech for the department of journalism. And, Mm -hmm. and I thought, what am I going to write about, you know? And so I had to think about it. And and some of the things that I think are so important in curating and telling our own story is sometimes we forget that authentic place or time or moment when we decided to do something and so I was always in the back of the, the publishing house. I was always exposed to the printing process and the editorial review process. I learned to spell using, you know, typesetting equipment. I wow. beefed, yeah, I beefed up on my my type, my keyboarding by typesetting with one of my aunts and learning how to proof and copy set things. And I and then also deadlines were very important. So if you're going to go to press, you need to know what a 15 minute, what a 30 minute, what a half day deadline is. And that actually helped me, you know, similarly to the way athletes are very structured and very focused, that actually really helped me at my school and my academics to be even more focused in getting my homework done and deadlines. Because if I was able to do that, then I got to go hang out at the newspaper and the print shop and contribute there. Awesome. It was a reward. That's amazing and like and super fun. Like I can only imagine that you had incredible experiences. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny because one of my favorite scents to this day, and it's hard to come by, is is printer's ink or the smell of ink. <laughs> but I know what it smells like because every once in a while I, I love papers and textures and yeah. fabrications. And every once in a while I'll be in an old like a, a antique, you know, shop or in a stationery store, and you get a whiff of like ink. It's not the best cologne, but I'll, you I know, understand. a perfume. But it has such. It's like when you smell someone's home cooking. When you go back home and you smell your grandmother's pie or something, yeah. and you realize it just takes you back to places. I catered for years um, in my twenties and early thirties, and. There's a certain smell the vans take on and then mm. like food smell. It's not a good smell. Like it's not, <laughs> it's not anything. Anybody's like, mm, that's delicious. Cause it's not like grease and I don't know, just whatever. And, but it's so comforting for me anytime I smell that because I'm like, I, I loved catering and I had so much fun despite crazy people and long hours and really hard so that smell means success to you probably or com- like you, you success, something comfort yeah. uh, I had a lot of fun a lot a lot of fun but yeah I so I relate to ink <laughs> yeah well it's interesting right and it, it, it's for me now you know when we're keyboarding or you know using whatever smart device that we have mm-hmm. I still type about 150 words a minute and oh, and wow. My kids were teasing me and they said, mom, why do you text so fast? 
And I said, it makes me look younger. And I said, he said, you know, the texting wasn't invented just for kids. I mean, we all use it now for right. communication, but I thought, I think I'm nimble and quick with my thumbs because I was always nimble and quick with my fingers and, and gamers create that also with dexterity and playing games. And, and I, I'm a, a very novice gamer by, by any means, but I think that being able to have that power of the keyboard. And that was the other component that I took in with me when and being able to, I took typing class and the teacher told me that I, I was going to have to work harder than everybody else because I was already typing over 125 words a minute. And I said, well, what do I have to do to get an A in the class? And she said, well, you know, you're going to have to type more complex things. So I shouldn't have revealed my superpower skills so early on because I ended up creating more work for myself. Right. Could have just sailed through. (laughs) (laughs) At what point did you start your entrepreneurial journey? Oh, interesting story. So I was working for a series of after in, uh, as a news reporter, I came back to Silicon Valley um, and which was originally called the land of heart's delight the, where San Jose, California ultimately is. And I came back to get my master's degree in journalism at UC Berkeley. And then I worked with a number of technology companies. I got recruited to come in house to be an in-house writer. And it was a lot more lucrative than being a reporter. And it was a different environment. I was not living out of a knapsack. I was not on assignment. It was a normal, you know, an office job uh, with in, in the tech sector, which I wanted to experience and explore. And to be honest, I, that wasn't where my heart initially was. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went to interview the CEO of the company and the CEO of the company sent his head of communications out to hire me and said that I asked the questions that, he was not expecting some 20 something to be asking at the time. Right. And so I asked him tough questions and he said, I want her on our team. So I kicked and screamed and said no for quite a while. And then about six weeks later, I ended up taking the job and I never looked back. To be honest, I, I ended up working with the best group of people. There were all former news reporters, all writers that worked in publishing or Mm -hmm. news reporting. And so we kind of had our own in-house editorial team. And from there, I learned some new skill sets. And then I worked for a couple other tech companies and took them through their IPOs. And after that, I still wasn't satisfied. I think one of the things I learned about working from a very large publicly traded companies and then working for a few private, what I would be considered kind of startup companies, companies that, you know, weren't IPO yet, was that I liked the fast pace of the of the private companies. You can make quicker and faster decisions like you could in the newsroom and in, you know, in the in, in the publishing house. And that's where I kind of zoomed in. I, I took a job with a with a company and they kind of gave me a big, a really big favor. They uh, had an instrument amount of funding. They had about 80 million in funding. And they hired me to come in to be their their vice president of corporate communications. But within five weeks, I got a, I got ushered into the office and it said, we got good news and we got bad news. And I said, okay, I've been waiting for the good news. <laughs> well, the good news was that they uh, were going to give me a severance package. And I thought, that's not good news. The bad news was that they lost their funding. And if I didn't take the package, I probably wouldn't get the money. Um, in, in the near future. So obviously I took the package. I mm-hmm. went out, I went to my car. Remember there was a moment of kind of disbelief at the time, to be honest, because it was after the dot-com bubble. I had a lot of friends, the housing market was crashing. I had a lot of friends that were out of work and, and there was just a lot of challenges happening, you know, after that, that whole era. I went to my car and on my, I don't know what compelled me, but I got in the car and I started driving to the local business license office. And the only reason I knew where it was, was I had gone there prior to get some personal license documents with family birth certificates and things like that. My instincts has told me to drive, go there, get a business license. Like, don't look back, like don't get another corporate job. And in my car, I called three people. I called my former boss, the company I had previously left, um, and obviously asked if I could have my job back. And he said, no, because you actually failed it with someone you that you trained and trained so well. When I, and we kind of get a giggle, he says, but I think I could use you for some projects. 
first client right there. Second, I called a venture capitalist I had worked with very closely and uh, told him that I was starting my own consultancy. He says, great, can you come tomorrow? And then the third person I called was a news reporter that I had worked with for a number of years. And I told him, I said, I, I, I'm independent. And he says, great, can you show up tomorrow? So within 24 hours, I had a business license. I had three pieces of work. And by the end of the first 90 days, I was already banking about $80,000 a month in, in revenue fees. Wow. So I didn't look back. And the and what that allowed me to do was not only was I resilient and, and quick, my instincts, I had everything, the makings to do that. I literally, I thought I would be independent and be and establish my own business, but I always kind of put it in my back pocket. Oh, it will happen later. It will happen to do something later. Well, at the same time, I was in the process of going through an adoption process. And I thought, wow, I have, the doors open. When doors close, they always open another side. And the flexibility that this would give me in becoming a parent. And right. so there's no such thing as balance. So I like to say, you know, agility is a really good thing. And we need a lot of agility in our life. So this basically gave me the runway that I needed to prepare for that next phase in my life, which was infant startup, entrepreneurship, and I had not infants, but toddlers coming into my life. Mm -hmm. And so literally it was like two startups at one time or two news stories at one time. Yeah, that's a lot. It was a lot. <laughs> How did you manage that? Because I mean, as a single mom, my kids were five and seven when I got divorced. My ex-husband moved a couple of hours away. So it was really just me and it was hard. And part of why, and similarly, like why I started my own business was because I could make my own hours and I could be there when the kids were, were home. So they never went to daycare and they, even though it wasn't the same as me being a stay at home mom, I was still there during the times that they wanted or needed me to be there. So how did you, how did you manage? Yeah. Uh, well, you just described, you know, I don't think we, we, we planned that, right? Yeah. You know, so I adopted, <laughs> I adopted when I was married. And then uh, seven years later, I became single, a single mom. And I had my business and, the, and I already had the structure in for my business, which was a good thing. When the kids first came and I adopted them from Russia, and so they were two and a half and four, they had language, they had sight, smells, behaviors, routines, all in place. And I needed to introduce them because I was hands-on and I was home and I was working from my kitchen table. I structured my day so that I was with the kids and then my client work, I would actually work. I wouldn't start until after 10. So they had activities and things happening in the morning, get the dog taken care of and, and all that, that activity. And the first 90 days, I really wanted to just get them to be equalized. I think I also needed to equalize myself because it was new, new. The whole household was new, right? Yeah. I mean, there's two more people. Like that's yeah. so but a lot. The great thing is at this point, I actually had, because it was almost nine months after, it was funny. It was nine months after I started my business, the kids came. The start came nine months later. And <laughs> and although it was a pretty long process, but I had a couple of women working for me at that time that were also stay-at-home moms with young kids. And so I needed help with this growing business. And so I hired these super moms. And one of them uh, had a, a five-year-old and the other one had a, a four-year-old and another one on the way. And I learned a lot from them because they were so disciplined and so structured and like, you know, they had times of days that they would work and they had a block of four hours, you know, more than 20 hours a week. And so I remember watching and learning from them, but when this tsunami came and it was actually, Oh, I just came all the way from Russia. Uh, my whole life has now changed. And then you're going through the eye of the needle. I don't think I thought twice about it. I think I just said, I'm going to do whatever it takes. Right. And it you just go through that inertia, right? And that, and you just go through. It's like going to um, time travel. It's just all kind of happens. Obviously, when they got older, and I was a single parent, it became a little different because uh, I didn't have the in infrastructure and help. So I needed to enlist help, and so I found some really great, um, you know, after school nannies that, that I found, you know, online and interviewed extensively to find the right fit because these people were not only going to be part 
like my children's life, they're going to be part of my family and part of the infrastructure. I ended up finding two that worked out really well. One was but in the morning when I when I didn't need her, she actually was going to college and she was working on a degree. And the afternoon when I did need her for, for some additional help, pick up after school and take my son to gymnastics and my daughter to tennis and, and those types of things. And she became part of our family. She was from uh, Ohio, I live in California. She would uh, stay for dinners. We'd cook together. I would help her. She, uh, you know, help, we'd help each other out. We became, we really became a community. Then when she needed to go to school full-time, I needed to find somebody else. And I ended up finding through referral, word of mouth, another great community family member. And she ended up working part-time at my office. And at this point, I'm not in my home office. I'm now in my business uh, eight plus years and had an office with 16 people. And so she became my AM PM in the morning. She was my office manager and assistant, and she was fabulous. In the afternoon, she was my kid care pickup and, and all, you know, basically Mary Poppins. And uh, she ended up becoming a nurse and going off at the same time, my kids no longer needed that and got to junior high school. So it worked out really well. But I think when it comes to finding the resources, it's always about asking. And, you know, because if you don't have a network, whether it's in business or it's in your personal life, it pays to ask anybody who looks trustworthy and ethical, you know, do they know anyone? Do you know anyone, you know, an office that can work? I was looking for an office manager and I, and I kind of sort of need daycare, but to find both in one and then to have two different, right. two, you know, two different payrolls, basically personal and, and professional payroll status was, you know, it was quite unusual. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And it, it sounds like just based on some of the experiences you've, you've shared, you're great at asking for help and for support when you need to. Yeah. You know what? One of the best lessons my father ever gave me was I was really timid and shy as a child. I Mm -hmm. I had a a Scottish grandmother. So I had a little mixture of a brogue and something else when I speak. And so I took a lot of speech therapy and kids would make fun of me. Kids could be mean. Right. And, and so I made it my advocation that not just taking speech therapy to pronounce things properly. I was going to excel at it, right? I was not going to be told no when I could be here, yes. And so one of the things I just persevered was by working with my my uncles, who were the news reporters, my father did the printing and the publishing part of the, the business, I would tag along with them. And finally, one day, my, my uncle... Uh, was going to go out on assignment. And I asked my father if I could go. And he said, yes. He says, and I said, well, I I said, I want to ask uncle if I can ask certain questions because I would write the questions and I've given to my uncle. My uncle would ask the questions and my uncle was fabulous. He had written for numerous magazines and and papers over the years and learned a lot from him. And so my family called me Rocky. They didn't call me Donna. They called me Rocky. And my uncle said, you know, Rocky, if you don't ask, you don't know. And my dad said, that's right. You got to ask. You got to stand up for yourself, not be that shy. I was 10 years old, mind you, you know, right? So right. I had to ask the questions. And so I learned from that. If you don't speak up, if you don't ask, also has a little bit to do with that. I'm, I'm the fourth of four girls. I had to speak up, right? Right. But, but if you don't ask, you don't know. And I think those are, you know, the curiosities that kind of play into, into my career as, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I know it's something a lot of women struggle with. They don't want to make waves. They don't want to offend anybody. So for somebody who's listening to this and is kind of connecting, oh, I, you know, maybe I can ask more or ask for help. What advice would you have for, for her? Yeah. You know, I think it's important to be as vulnerable as, and, and equally as powerful. I mean, you could be both, right. right. You know, asking for help doesn't mean that you're not capable and asking for for help doesn't mean that you know you're you're not powerful. I think it's just letting people know. I mean, for the longest time, my friends didn't even know 
that I was going through a period of my life where my marriage wasn't great and that it was affecting me personally and it was affecting my business and it was definitely affecting my children. But when I finally made that decision that something had to change and I could live in this bubble, it wasn't a perfect bubble, but I could live in it. But when I actually decided that it was time to get out of the bubble, Mm -hmm. It was liberating. And I think if we support each other in the sisterhood, we'll probably find out there's a lot more people that might have experienced or, or, or had the similar scenario that with that asking, you know, for assist or advice or wisdom in the sisterhood that we're all part of, I think you'd be surprised. I was really surprised. My kids used to used to use the word warm fuzzy. And mm-hmm. I was actually surprised because I'm a, I'm a two public relations for a living. So perception is very important to me. And so the power of perception in the, you know, can is something that was just, you know, for me, it was almost stigmatic. Right. And when I became vulnerable in my personal side and was able to seek out assist and help, the stress just rolled off. And I think that's the part that was so liberating to me was like the ability to make change, the chasm in which we actually facilitate and make change in our life. We control that. And so I'm a big believer in visual, the visualization and manifestation. I have a visual board on my at my home desk. Uh, I had the same image on my phone. So if there's something that you want to manifest and you want to achieve and believe, then I think that's a great starting point. I wish that I actually was practicing that further back in my life. I think I would have had other, other graces come to me easier without less struggle. And I think that's one of the things that personally, like every day I make sure my phone doesn't light up before 7 a.m., That's a boundary that I've set. My phone actually starts going dark at 10 p.m. That's a boundary that I have set. I didn't used to set boundaries. Right. I really feel like a lot of women don't. We feel like we have to be available to help everybody all of the time. And at least with my work, and maybe your experience is a little bit different, but setting that those boundaries is hard. But once you start doing it, then it's like, Oh, this actually feels really good. Yeah. And it, and without having conversations with other people necessarily, the relationship starts to change for the better. Yeah, I think it's I'm trying to think of the the the, the uh, bread and jam for Francis is a kid's book. Do you know that? Oh, book? Yes. <laughs> and every day, <laughs> every day, Francis the raccoon would have the same thing: bread and jam. And she was totally satisfied with that until it was like, Francis, do you want to try something else? And she tried and she just like, no, but just not feel very good about that choice. And then she would go back to her bread and jam and then she'd try something else. And, and eventually she ended up finding, I think the book ends. And if I'm wrong, I apologize. The book is still out there. I'll need to reread it. But at the end, I think she ends up trying to jam, you know, and, and realizing that, okay, it's okay to, kind of color outside the lines and try something new and explore life and be a little adventurous. And I think oftentimes that we play it really safe. Starting your own business and being an entrepreneur is not safe. It was probably the stupidest thing I ever did was to hop in my car and drive to the business office. And I remember looking when I got there at the sign and and I saw all the different types of business, auto mechanic and, and hair salon and nail salon and and uh, you know, restaurants and bakeries and all these things. You had a business, you know, you get a business license for your expert. And I looked up this sign, I go, I don't know where my expertise is. Because I was so used to being in it and working for somebody else dictating the rules that that moment that I that actually the entrepreneurship kicked in, it was like an epiphany, right? Literally, it was like, you know. It was the, the Kraken. <laughs> it was literally <laughs> the Kraken was open. And and here, you know, t- I celebrated 20 years during the pandemic. And I don't think anyone noticed because we were just so busy doing everything else. And I thought, wow, 
that 20 years went by really fast. And now I'm working on a book. And so that's another phase. And I've created a podcast uh, mm-hmm. this last year. And that was another dimension and phase. And and so when you created your podcast, I'm, I'm sure there were people that said, well, why would you want to do that? Because Throughout I got a lot of it. Life, why would you want to do that? <laughs> yeah. Well, well I like it? the risk. I mean, there's days where I'm like, why, why am I doing this? Believe me. But I like doing things my way and figuring it out. If you were to have a bumper sticker, I remember that you people used to put bumper stickers on their car. Right? I've been thinking about this. Like, what would that bumper sticker say? And I could try to think about that. Think about that. One word. And I kept thinking, you know what? I just want people to smile. It would have to be like a 57 Chevy blue pickup truck with a bunch of pumpkins in the back. And it would just say, wow. Mm-hmm. It really doesn't need much definition or anything beyond that. And it wouldn't necessarily define me as a person. Yeah. But I just thought if I could just make people smile with a bumper sticker, <laughs> they would just say, wow. <laughs> I like that, but it's so it's simple and still makes a statement. Or maybe why not? That's even better. Why not? Because yeah. imagine if you're stuck in traffic and you're behind a, a car and the and the, the bumper sticker. In fact, there's a company. It's a fabulous company uh, that makes a digital license plate, so you could actually have your license plate say a phrase or a message, unless there's an emergency alert, then it has to say Amber Alert or something like that. But I thought. It's a little bit cheeky to say people, why not? It's yeah. like, well, maybe the person is just thinking about deciding what to get for lunch or something that's basically that, but maybe they're thinking about it's time for me to leave my job. It's time for me to leave that relationship. It's time for me to try something different. Why not? Yeah. I mean, really, if you, at least in my experience, if you ask that question to yourself enough times, you can't run out of objections yeah. And you get to the core of what you really want. Yeah. Well, and you asked me about my advice to women. One of the other things that I exercise as I do, I've, and I'll do it a couple of times a year, is I'll take an eight and a half, 11 sheet paper and I'll fold it. And I will just kind of do my own like checks and balances. How am I doing? Mm-hmm. So I have my vision part and I'll say, okay, my personal and my business. And when you run your own business and you're, this last couple of years, I spent more time at my home office than I did my, my, my business office. It becomes a little bit of a blur, right? And so right. that's one of the things I really enjoy about having a, a business office because I can kind of separate the two. But it was great when my kids were little. Now I kind of want a little more of that, that extra you know, uh, separation. But make a list and put you know, the things that, that you're most enchanted with. Mm-hmm. And the things that you're maybe disenchanted, you can use whatever words you want. Sometimes right. I put, you know, wise and wiser. What are the things that I feel that I feel that I'm wise about? What are the things that I want to be wiser about? What are things that I want to learn? Mm-hmm. And and so that's one of the the, the things that you know, I was talking about the the Weber space scope. I just think, wow, the man and woman hours that it took. Because you know, we saw hidden figures. We figured there must be a lot of women involved in this project. No one's saying yet, but I'm right. sure there's a story behind the story. Are the people who worked on this project and the decades of research and, and the things that, that happened prior to this evolution of creating this, this platform didn't happen overnight. Our evolution doesn't happen overnight either. No. We, if we're not growing and, and we're not learning, we're not evolving. And I think that's really important is that I am the first to have super high expectations for myself, but I also need to accept that I need to, I I can't necessarily do it all now. This last week, I'll mention it. I had been battling with COVID. I don't think none of us are exempt. I've done everything possible to, to not get the, to get the, the, the nasty bug. But when it hit me, it it was a, a subtle reminder. Well, not too subtle. It was pretty pretty bold. To <laughs> slow down, take an act, take a nap, sleep, hydrate, stay in. My closets are clean again. I mean, my closets were dirty, but during the pandemic, when, when we were all shelter in place, I you know every room in the house was was scrubbed uh, down to the baseboards, 
And now I kind of went through and did my spring cleaning. I get a little bored, a little anxious. My mind isn't as focused as I'd like it to be. Mm-hmm. I sat down to to write and hopefully a whole chapter in my book. I ended up writing a couple of pages. And then I had to accept that I I contributed to the book. I wasn't going to contribute a whole chapter because I just, my mind and my focus wasn't there. And I had to accept that. I had to accept that right now. Maybe I'm not right at my at my full throttle, but you know, next week I'll get I'll go back and I'll complete that chapter. But I think we need to maybe like lighten up on the gas pedal just a little bit sometimes and enjoy the ride. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting that you're saying that because I we were discussing this before we hit record. I was in Italy last week and there were a lot of adventures and we were on this amazing winery tour that the guide was driving us around in a van. And is there any bad wine in Italy? I don't think so. (laughs) No, but I will say the last one we went to, I think was the best wine I've ever had. Uh, That, that being said, the electricity had gone out at the villa that we, I was staying at and the people that were staying with me had not handled it right away. I was getting really frustrated and we were kind of talking about it and everything. And my girlfriend asks our driver, like, you know, something about the electricity and, you know, shouldn't that be, shouldn't we get it back on and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, you know, he's like, sometimes not having electricity forces you to do the things that really you need to do and to honor yourself. He's like, I like having those moments, you know, because there's not anything you can do about it, right? It'll yeah, it's like back. a reset, right? Yeah. And he's like, light some candles, enjoy the darkness, take things in. And the, I mean, the general flow of life was slower where we were at anyways. And yeah, like it's, it's similar in listen to your body and we don't need to be going a million miles an hour. Yeah. Well, you know, my parents were married 50 some years. I can't, I don't even know how long I think it ended up being like 55 years or maybe even close to 60. My father would go to work. My mother was a nurse uh, and she would go, they worked slightly different hours. So, but, but I never knew that either one of my parents were work. I mean, there was just normal TV that I had professional parents. So I never felt that they weren't at home, you know, and I always made sure with my kids too that they they, they were they they were uh, conscious that you know I wasn't like the babysitter was their second mom and was a helper, but you know that I was always present and always home. But my father would go to work without a phone. My mother would go to work without a phone, and they would come home. My mother was usually home 35, 40 minutes before my father, it seemed, and she'd come home and she'd prepare dinner. My father would go into the kitchen and, and, and prepare along with her. It wasn't, you know, and we're talking like seventies here. Right. 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 And so it was pretty progressive that my dad was doing that. Yeah. <laughs> and then we would sit down at the, fa- at the dinner table and we would talk about my father's favorite subject. And one good thing that happened to you today. And one good, th- and one thing that, that you would like to change or do differently. Well, if I was a little bit naughty or did something, I hated that part of our dinner to conversation. But <laughs> what I learned, what I learned from that was, yeah, and I directly across from my father, so I knew, you know, that would, sometimes that was intentionally for just for Donna, right? But what I learned from that was that throughout the day we were totally disconnected, and because we were, it was we were living in the digital world, we would come together as a family unit that was that time to reconnect and engage and have conversation and laughter and food are great connectors and people. I I don't think people, you know, laugh enough. I don't think we nearly laugh enough. And I think that, and you were just in Italy where you have such gracious, you know, happy go lucky people with fabulous food and the language becomes almost irrelevant because the people and the food so great that kind of around the table discussion that my father led every night was something that empowered him and made him feel great. 
But it also was a check-in with four four girls, and there's an age difference. Me, I, my oldest sister is ten years older than me, so there's a big difference between a ten year old. You know, a well, she was in college already, so I say you know, sixteen and six would be a big difference, right? Right. And but I, I, I factored that in when I became a parent. You know, we realized like, oh, I'm becoming my parent. I factored that in. My kids told me, he said, Mom, a lot of my friends don't sit down and have dinner with their families. And I said, Well, what do they do? And they said, Oh, they just microwave or they'll just sit at the counter, or you know, it's just the food's always there, and they just take care of themselves. And I thought, I really took, you know, for me personally. I made sure that dinner after working and going to meetings or whatever I was doing was like, that was like a milestone moment. That was like the end of the day. We all came together. We're going to sit. We're going to talk about the homework or school or activities. Things are happening and being able to, you know, come together and share. And I didn't know one of the things my kids revealed years later, they said they hated Crock-Pot Tuesday. (laughs) <laughs> Tuesday was my crock pot day. And on Tuesday, I they never said anything. The little they were a little they awesome. were a little sneaky. And we were cleaning out the garage one day and they said they start giggling. And they were teenagers. They're like 14, 15. I said, What? So funny. He says, Can we get rid of the crock pot? And I said, I like the crock pot. And they said, Yeah, but you got another thing. This is pre-instapot. I had something that was like an instapot, but it wasn't instapot. And they revealed that Crock-Pot Tuesday meant that they were going to have to talk longer at the dinner table. Because when I cooked, when the meat wasn't cooking and the chicken wasn't in the stew, whatever, I was making the Crock-Pot, dinner would be ready to go. We'd sit down pretty f- quickly. Whereas right. when I came home, it wasn't Crock-Pot Tuesday. It was at least another 30 minutes of prep work. <laughs> <laughs> that is too funny. That's yeah. Too so funny. that was funny. And my, I got my mom. Bobby would have really liked that crock pot. <laughs> I did the same thing. I mean, we sat at the dinner table every night until my younger guy played football. And even then, we still ate dinner together. But it was just shorter because he was everything was a little bit more condensed. But it got to a point where my kids' friends came over and would hang out with us. They weren't necessarily having dinner with us, but we would also, uh, we'd talk about what we were grateful for. We'd learned that day, you know, random, random kind of check-in questions and their friends started participating and I mean, it'd be hours. Yeah. And, you know what? I like the word grateful. I yeah. personally like to call Thanksgiving grateful day. Cause I think we should be grateful every day for the littlest things. Right. And yeah. I, with, with COVID, I've, I've thought, I think of three years of dodging this thing, three vaccinations. I've been to Canada for business and have come back. No problem. And the, I don't, within my own zip code, I get sick. Right. Right. And, and so I think it just, it's just a, you know, one of those like you said, reminders that we just kind of need to hit the reset button. Yeah. You know, I've been really playing with this culture of overwhelm that mm. we all are buying into. And and I say that because there's so much about, you know, avoid overwhelm, everybody's burned out, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, we can choose to be overwhelmed or not to some extent. I mean, there's moments where overwhelm happens because things are happening that are outside of our control, but you could still choose how you react to that at some point and choose to not do as many things. Yeah, I think, Having a list, I mean, one of the things I, I put on my on my iPhone, it's just in notes. I actually list kind of like what I'm grateful for. Mm-hmm. And I try to discipline myself to look at it daily. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes I'll just want to listen to some music. Uh, there's a ringtone in Apple that actually doesn't, it doesn't annoy me. A lot of ringtones annoy me, but there's this one chime when it starts going off in the morning. Oftentimes I wake up way before my alarm clock goes off. Mm-hmm. And do you remember those, those uh, clocks? They still make them. You find them. They're the moonbeams and that you'd wake up to light. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I had one of those, a retro one of those. And that's pretty much the, kind of the what I've set my phone to now. And I sleep so much better. You know, Ariana Huffington uh, wrote a whole book just on yeah. sleep and the power of sleep. And and I thought, wow, here's this really 
phenomenal, phenomenal, you know, business leader and an entrepreneur. And she, she likes sleep because we're, we're kind of often told that, you know, sleeping is, you yeah. know, you can sleep later and you can skip this and skip that. And it's just like, well, I kind of like my sleep. I it's do. Okay. I feel so much better. And everybody's so much happier around me when I'm sleeping. <laughs> yeah. I get a little cranky and the weekends particularly like I love, I don't set my alarm on the weekends. That's another, another boundary is the weekends are, are unplugged. The weekends are not scheduled. Even mother's day. And this is one of my mother's day, like things, challenges for all the moms out there. I love my children doing things for me, but on mother's day, I personally rather be home and cook together Mm -hmm. And enjoy it than going to a pre-planned by somebody else brunch. Right. I, if I'm going to do brunch, I'd rather do it after or before Mother's Day. I don't want to go when everybody else is there. Same with Valentine's Day. That's no fun either. But yeah. I, I think that the family community that you know that that you described and 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 that I you cherish and I, I cherish as well is that we might be really busy, but let's not you know, forget about the details and the little things. Like right. when you work for a catering company, I'm sure there are a lot of details. And in my line of business, there's a lot of details. And so let's not forget to detail our own life because I think we're going to enjoy it that much better. I agree. I agree. And you know what? I'm going to wrap up with that because I think that's such a powerful statement. Donna, this has been an amazing conversation. So thank you. I feel so much better too. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad. And and share with everybody because I'm sure people want to connect with you. Where can you be found? Well, one of my favorite places, I guess, is uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, it's just Donna Laughlin and it's L-O-U-G-H-L-I-N. Uh, I have a podcast called Before It Happened, which is a show focused around visionaries and and imagining the future. And, and we cover an array of topics, everything from the pet food supply chain to uh, the, the work environment to mm -hmm. the future of uh, automotive and uh, automotive transportation robots and all kinds of interesting topics. Um, so that's the before it happens show and all the podcast platforms. And you can also email me if you're really adventurous. Um, my email is Donna at lmgpr.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. That was liberating, wasn't it? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being a listener of the Tribe of Leaders podcast. I am so grateful for each and every episode that you tune in and listen to. And I hope that you get a ton of value that you can implement starting today. I do have just a quick favor. If you wouldn't mind hopping on to wherever it is that you listen to podcasts and leave us a rating and review, it would help us tremendously so that the Tribe of Leaders podcast can be found more easily and help inspire other entrepreneurial leaders. 